Okay. So the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda is rooted, or was rooted in historical events and processes that existed within, but also beyond the borders of the country. When we try to understand why the genocide in Rwanda occurred, there is no single answer. We can't point to one thing and say, yes, that's why it happened. Um, there's no single answer that adequately explains the horror and the destruction that took place there. Um, many processes converged during that 100 day period that we now know as the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda. And today we're only examining one component of that, the role of colonialism and the legacy of colonialism that extended decades beyond colonial rule all the way up until 1994. So in this talk, I'm going to briefly cover some key elements of Rwanda's history including details about Rwanda during the pre-colonial and the colonial times and how this legacy of colonialism directly and indirectly contributed to colonial uh, to the 1994 genocide. Here's the thing, and this is something that I always, um, I'm always surprised when people are surprised to hear this, but um, here's the thing. Prior to colonial rule, there was an established Rwandan kingdom that existed. Uh, and its boundaries actually roughly trace the current map of Rwanda. This kingdom was highly organized. It traded throughout the region and it, it included a shared culture, language and leadership. It was, um, it was there well before colonialism and of course remains well after colonialism. Now colonial rule began unbeknownst to Rwandans. They had no idea about the infamous Berlin Conference of 1884 and 1885. Uh, when European powers carved up the African continent like a cake that was free for the taking. They had no idea that this was even taking place. They had no idea that Germany and Belgium had come into an agreement about controlling that region. And it was several more years before German explorers and administrators even made contact. Still, colonialism arrived in Rwanda and quite frankly, it wreaked havoc. Um, it wreaked havoc until Rwanda became an independent country in 1962 and beyond. And by then, colonialism had radically changed the systems of power and influence that existed throughout the country, uh, thus ensuring its destructive legacy continued well after they were gone. And I have to also note that they did this side by side along with Christian evangelism, which arrived around the exact same time. Um, and it isn't the focus of today's talk, but it will come up a few times as evangelism and the white fathers who came, uh, their efforts went hand in hand with colonialism and they often served to justify colonial supremacy over Africans in Rwanda and beyond Rwanda. Um, but today we'll focus really on the lasting impact of colonialism. Here, um, I wanna note that when we trace the history of Rwanda, we risk what historian Jean-Pierre Chrétien refers to as the double trap. Uh, there's this double trap of liberal and radical history as he explains them. So on the one hand, we have a liberal history of Rwanda, which might inaccurately over idealize pre-colonial Rwanda and describe it as a paradise. It might pretend that the Mwami uh, or King, as he was, um, he, he would be referred to now, uh, that Mwami Rabugiri's uh, pre-colonial rule was filled with peace and stability. It might overlook that Rabugiri, he had this very aggressive um, military expansion campaign that dominated the decades of his rule. He also went on a murderous purge of his own family members, and there was tremendous instability and violence that occurred after his death. Now, on the other hand, a radical history of Rwanda would pretend that Rwandan history only began with the arrival of white colonizers. Such a version would mark the start of Rwanda's history with the arrival of Richard Kant, maybe in 1898, and it would ignore the rich history that preceded colonialism. Neither version is accurate. And so today we're gonna do our best to avoid those pitfalls and chart our own course. So, Moving in chronological order, let's start with what did Rwanda look like before colonialism? Most historians agree that by the 15th century, Rwanda was organized into small semi-autonomous states. 
But when exactly the kingdom of Rwanda, as it was found when the colonial administrators arrived and explorers arrived, when that it was founded, it is still subject to debate. But what we do know is that by the 18th century, a monarchical state had developed in Rwanda and it had resulted in the creation and recognition of three distinct categories, Hutu, Tutsi, and Twa. Rwanda's monarchy was Tutsi-led and the royal family was comprised almost exclusively of Tutsis. Still at the same time, some of the court rituals were carried out by Hutus and a number of Hutus served as chiefs and sub-chiefs throughout the kingdom. Thus, it was during this pre-colonial period that the off-sited identities of Tutsi and Hutu took shape, both as political and cultural and socioeconomic terms. But they were not the rigid ethnic categories that we saw in 1994. Instead, they were associated with power, um, who was the patron, who was the client, uh, wealth, those were the ways that you distinguish between Tutsi and Hutu. And throughout this period, there's also a degree of identity fluidity that exists. So if a Hutu acquired enough wealth and power, they could transition into the Tutsi category. And alternatively, uh, if a Tutsi lost their wealth, they or lost their status, they could transition to becoming a Hutu. Rwanda's pre-colonial period was also patriarchal, meaning that it was controlled by men. The Mwami, or king, uh, also had this almost demigod-like status. And this power and the kingship passes from father to son. Now, that said, I do want to uh, make the case that women did exercise some power during this period. Uh, for example, there was the queen mother, or the mother of the Mwami, she held significant clout and influence often over the Mwami and over others and her power, her influence, even though it was because she was the mother of the king, it also existed independent of the king. Now in 1860, Mwami, Mwami Rabugiri ascended to the throne and he rules for 35 years. And under his sovereignty, the kingdom, kingdom grows. It, um, it grows in size and it also becomes increasingly centralized in its power, despite all of these internal skirmishes that occurred with, within the royal court. Um, and this includes the fact that the Mwami at one point decided to murder off members of his family as part of a lineage purge. Um, and there were also continuous military campaigns that expanded the geographic size of the kingdom considerably. This was a, a real big period of transition internally and externally within Rwanda um, and its borders. Now the royal court during this time was rife with intrigue um, and individuals and clans vied for influence and power. And there was this whole culture of subversion and conspiracy that contributed a bit to instability within the royal court and the kingdom. And so it's no surprise in a way that when Rabugiri dies after 35 years of rule, two of his sons end up competing for the kingship and they further destabilized the kingdom. Here we see that the role of the queen mother ended up proving quite vital. So the heir to the throne was a young man named Ruta Rindwa, and he had been designated by his father, Rabugiri, to take over when Rabugiri died. The problem is that Ruta Rindwa was being raised by an adopted mother because Rabugiri had had his mother killed as part of one of those lineage purges. So he's being raised by an adopted mother known as Kanjagera. And Kanjagera turns on her adopted son and instead favors the ascent of her son by birth, Musinga. She wants him to become the king. Now, remember the queen mother is this powerful person in and of her own right. And here Kanjagera through her adopted son and her birth son was arguably the most powerful person in Rwanda. Kanjagera kept a tight rein over her own son and turned to clan purges political assassinations and ruthless violence to gain control of the kingdom. And this period of violence and instability really proves the monarchy's undoing because it syncs almost exactly in terms of chronology with the time when the German administrators are trying to uh, gain influence in Rwanda and colonize Rwanda. So by the 1890s, we see that instability and violence have greatly weakened the kingdom 
and they've created a power vacuum. And into that space enters Richard Kant, a German explorer, and the White Fathers, Catholic priests who also sought to influence the kingdom. They capitalized upon this conflict and exacerbated the continuing power struggle for kingship, um, often manipulating one party against the other to vie for power. This is how they established themselves as colonial rulers. Now, there's a bit more to it. Um, there was an invasion of rogue Belgian forces out of the Congo um, that ended only after the German administrators got involved and invoked a pact that existed between Germany and Belgium. Again, this is one of those things that Rwanda didn't necessarily know about. This had all been agreed upon a decade earlier and on a whole other continent. Um, but in the end, all of this um, serves the interests of Kanjagera's son by birth, Musinga. He ascends to the throne and Kanjagera's adopted son, Rutorindwa, is out. So now we have King Musinga, Mwami Musinga. Now what's interesting is that as Mwami, and by the way, he's photographed here, uh, in his, he's an adult here. So this photograph was taken um, in the 1910s thereabout. Um, and here you can actually see uh, a photograph of him along with members of the royal family in traditional garb outside of a traditional um, Rwandan home. Now, as king, as Mwami, Musinga embraced the German protectorate so quickly that actually there is an argument among some historians who question if he really understood what he was doing when he accepted Ger the German flag and German aid. At the same time, the court was divided over the influence of German rule and also this policy of accommodation, which was eventually instituted by Conjugera's main advisor. Remember, the queen mother is still heavily influential at this time, and her son is quite young, so she's capitalizing on that to insert herself and exert her influence. But um, there's all this uh, intrigue within the court, those that disagree with this policy, those that are for it. And these differences came to a violent head in 1905. And uh, power coups had occurred in the past, but this time around, the German administrators are so powerful that they are able to intervene and stop the usual wave of killings that unrolled after the power coup. And so Richard Kant, the German resident of Rwanda, he was the figure that was really key to his country's success in Rwanda. Uh, he was appointed to this post officially in 1908, and he set about instituting a number of changes that still influence Rwanda. Uh, for example, he named Kigali the capital of the country. Kigali was not the capital of the country before this. This was not the power center. The power center was in the South where the king resided, the Mwami. He made Kigali the capital and so it remained um, and so it remains today. He also deftly manipul manipulated conflicts that existed between the Rwandan monarchy and the White Fathers, further ensuring and expanding German influence. He would often be, um, Kant would be brought in to adjudicate whenever there was a dispute between the White Fathers and the monarchy and as a result he was able to keep gaining more and more influence. Uh, meanwhile, the tensions that existed between the royal court and the White Fathers eventually did come to a head. And so after the Belgians formally replaced the Germans as the colonial authority in 1922, this uh, follows after World War I, where Germany is stripped of their colonies as punishment for their role in World War I. Belgium is the uh, country that gains Rwanda and Burundi, the um, Rwanda's uh, neighboring country to the south, and together that at the time they were referred to as Rwanda Urundi. Um, so Belgium takes over in 1922, and by then Musinga and the White Fathers are fighting constantly. And so the White Fathers secure the downfall of Mwami Musinga, and they replace him with the more pliable Mwami Mutara. Don't worry about remembering all of these names. I know there's a lot of it's um, a lot of names that I'm throwing at you. What the point really illustrates is that by then the Catholic priests, the white fathers were so powerful that they were able to dethrone a king, a sitting Mwami and put in someone that they uh, felt would be more pliable, one who had readily converted to Catholicism and um, they saw as an ally. That's how powerful they had become. Now, uh, before I start speaking about Belgian rule over Rwanda, which I'm going to, you know, spoiler alert, was um, terribly destructive. Um, uh, 
I want to briefly address another legacy of first German, but also Belgian colonialism, and that is racism, systemic racism, institutionalized racism, and the Hamitic myth. These colonizers introduced the pseudoscience of race and theories of culture-coded racism into Rwandan society. And, um, and this has a ripple effect all the way through to 1994 and beyond. So here's uh, just a little bit of background. During the 19th and the 20th centuries, Europeans had developed stereotypes about the alleged, alleged stupidity, simplicity, and inherent threat of Black people. White European treatment of non-whites was characterized by race-based discrimination and this assumption of white superiority. And this race-based hierarchy promoted the subjugation and mistreatment of blacks by their white oppressors. European racist notions at the time prompted them to equate the African continent as a whole, this large, beautiful, diverse space with uncivilized societies and savagery that required civilizing and control. The problem was that kingdoms such as Rwanda challenged European myths about Black Africa. Rwanda was a highly developed society. It had established boundaries, a complex hierarchy, elaborate rituals. To explain how that could be, Europeans seized upon and propagated the Hamitic theory. Basically, they claimed that the Tutsi ruling class in Rwanda must be the lost sons of Ham. Who is Ham? He is from the biblical story of Noah, and he was Noah's son, the one who was banished for laughing at his father's nakedness. And this myth enabled Europeans to cling to their imperialist racism. It ended up um, being used by colonizers around continent to explain any sign of development throughout Africa. And in Rwanda, it also contributed to the Tutsis becoming a racialized minority. The colonial application of the Hamitic myth signals this moment where the link between race and color was ruptured in Rwanda. And from then on, Tutsi starts to become a racial category and not just an ethnicity. This is a theory that has been explored in great detail by a scholar named Mahmoud Madani, and he writes really brilliantly about this. Now, the journal, German colonialists deployed the Tutsi minority as a ruling class over the majority Hutu. They thought they had found their lost European brothers and they uh, elevated them in status as such. Um, this was also a very effective weapon for colonial rule, divide and conquer, um, indirect rule through a select minority class, giving them some favors, but still keeping them under the heel of the colonizers. They also took a rather direct approach in some instances, meddling directly in state affairs, particularly against the Muami and the Muami's consolidated and before them indisputed power. Germany controlled Rwanda using this very highly effective hybrid approach of indirect rule through the Tutsis, divide and conquer policy, and then asserting themselves through the royal court and its network of loyal chiefs and sub-chiefs. Um, education was also interestingly a way that they were able to exacerbate the division between Hutu and Tutsi. Um, and education sat with the white fathers. They opened the first school in Rwanda in 1905, and they formalized an instruction policy in which Tutsis were taught in French, a European language, and Hutus were taught in Swahili, a local Bantu language. Um, this further exacerbated divisions, and you start seeing um, some explanation for why there were multiple rebellions during this period, um, predominantly Hutu-led, and they would target the, the monarchy rather than the colonialists, which is such an interesting, um, it's an interesting sidebar because here they weren't going after the, the real um, source of tension and, and disruption in, in their lives. They were um, buying into this anti-Tutsi ideology that had been introduced through the indirect rule of the colonial powers. So Belgium takes control of Rwanda after the defeat of Germany in World War I. And they collapse, uh, they had three colonies at this point, and they collapse them into one conglomerate, Congo, Belge, et Iru, uh, Rwanda, Urundi. So it's the Congo, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Rwanda, and Burundi. They collapse them all together in 1925. And this is a 
massive swath of land that contains many different groups and languages and kingdoms and people. Um, they did a horrific job. They were horrible colonizers. Uh, they were very destructive. And they institutionalized that German constructed distinction between Hutu and Tutsi in Rwanda. Later on, they even went further and turned myth effectively into fact by developing colonial policies that were based upon the division between this distinction they had created between Hutu and Tutsi. So um, some examples, Belgian colonizers enacted colonial reform uh, policies in the 1920s. Uh, they went about reducing the number of Hutu chiefs and subchiefs and concentrated power into the hands of a few select Tutsi chiefs who were able to rule with relative autonomy, autonomy and almost um, complete and absolute impunity, to be honest. While these measures were intended at the time to weaken the king in favor of the Tutsi chiefs and work towards his downfall, it also resulted in exacerbated Hutu Tutsi divisions. Um, this period of colonial rule also excluded women. Uh, there were women who had roles in the royal court um, and in the animist uh, faith practices that were that existed in Rwanda. But instead, uh, we see their uh, marginalization both in public and private spheres further and further codified by the Belgians. And the Belgians squeezed Rwanda's Hutu population ruthlessly. They wanted to maintain a steady stream of goods that went into their hands. And so they sanctioned the use of force to impose mandatory unpaid Hutu labor, um, to collect goods and taxes. Um, they were extremely violent uh, and their, their attitude was quite simple. They charged the Tutsi chiefs with collecting and organizing this steady flow of goods. And some of them complied quite willingly and happily, but others, they were told, you whip the Hutu or we will whip you. And so they were forced into this role of master for some. Others were more than happy to comply. I don't wanna pretend it was one way or the other. Uh, there's complexity to this narrative. But then came the census, the national census of 1933 and 34, where Belgians sought to identify ethnicity on the basis of oral accounts, physical measurements. You can see photographs here of what that looked like, um, cattle herd size, uh, et cetera. Once they were able to, in their minds, categorize the people according to Hutu or Tutsi, and for a very small minority, Twa, they codified it. And with that fluidity uh, on this Hutu-Tutsi continuum, the ability to transition between Hutu and Tutsi, that, that disappears. Instead, ethnicity was established at birth. It passed on from father to child, thereby eliminating any role um, for women in whether or not they're the identity of their children, the ethnic identity. And it was put into identity cards and used um, throughout the country as a means for gaining favor and um, being treated according to a, a tiered class system. Then things changed. There was World War II that came. And for the Belgians, ironically, the tables were turned and suddenly they were the ones being occupied by a foreign power, even as they continued to occupy Rwanda. After World War II, the United Nations was created and there was this push for self-rule throughout the colonized states within Africa. And you start to see independent movements that sweep the continent. And during the 1950s, this, uh, this uh, wave of independence movements is, um, is vibrant and, and happening also in Rwanda. And you see the Tutsi elite followed quickly by the Hutu elite beginning to call for Rwanda's independence. Now the role of German and Belgian colonizers in the construction and manipulation of ethnic identity ends up being central to this pre and immediate post independence period. And this period sees a lot of ethnic fracture and violence. Colonialism effectively split the Hutus and the Tutsis into separate consciousnesses and opposed ethnic groups. Um, in this way, unfortunately, Rwanda followed a unique path to statehood. And unfortunately, the Hutu and the Tutsi were not able to unify in their efforts. Some tried, 
and some did, but um, they were um, they were effectively overwhelmed by the those that sought to ex instead focus on what divided them. So, for example, when the United Nations decolonization mission arrived in Kigali in 1957 to do an assessment, it received two contrasting documents. One was drafted by the Muami's court and called for a transfer of power from Belgians back to the Muami. They wanted to reinstitute the monarchy and bring the Muami back into power and establish a kingdom of Rwanda. They received a second draft, a second document, and this one was drafted by nine Hutu male intellectuals that denounced Tutsi domination, called for popular rule, and drew upon the Hamitic myth that had been popularized by the colonial powers. And this document, by the way, is famously known as the Hutu Manifesto. A series of ethnic-based atrocities committed by Hutus and Tutsis followed throughout the 1950s. And this decade saw political turmoil, growing ethnic tensions. Um, the Belgians and the Catholic Church continued to maneuver and manipulate in this bid for power. And rather than engage both parties and try to develop a unified approach for a peaceful transition of power, you see the Belgians and the Catholic Church set one group against the other, exacerbating these ethnic divisions, drafting documents, helping to widen the gap that existed between them even further. And so despite a shared language, a shared history, a shared culture, a shared religion, shared traditions, nationalism uh, did not trump ethnic divisionism in Rwanda. Instead, we see that nationalism incorporated ethnic related colonial myths and stereotypes. And by the time of the 1959 revolution, these tensions exploded into acts of violence. Now, the 1959 revolution followed on the heels of the sudden death of Mwami Mutara and the formation of a number of political parties in Rwanda that were grounded in ethnic identity and which ended up strengthening the, um, the Hutu majority in Rwanda. This period was marked by cyclical violence against Tutsis, ethnic extremism, and the first instances that we see of large scale perpetration of violence uh, against, Rwand uh, against Rwand Rwandans turning against Rwandans. This is the first instance of it in modern Rwandan history. Um, I also wanna note that we also start to see the first instances of rescue. So there are those moments of heroism and upstanderism that existed even in 1959 and the early 1960s. Um, but this is the, really the first wave of mass violence that we see in modern Rwandan history. Um, and unfortunately, that was a cycle that started to repeat itself from the 1959 all the way through to 1994. These years also saw the end of Tutsi minority rule and a reorganization of power um, that was shared by a nexus of Hutu elites, many of whom were from a clan in the North. Now the Belgians really, they could have worked towards a peaceful transition of power. I firmly believe they could have. Instead, they provoked violence. They played the two sides off of one another to what I think they perceived as their own benefit at the time. And unfortunately the Catholic church ended up offering political, moral, and logistic assistance to the Hutu leaders, even as they were calling for and perpetrating violence against the Tutsi minority. And so the colonial masters of the time really failed Rwanda. And unfortunately, uh, in the end, colonial, Belgian colonial influence did not result in a democratic Rwanda. On the contrary, um, up until 1994, the country was ruled by two dictators. Uh, the first one was Gregor Kaibanda, who is pictured here, um, standing with Belgian and Rwandan officials. And the second uh, ruler was Juvenal Habyarimana. Kaibanda's newly formed Hutu government sought to, um, well, they sought vengeance. They sought to punish and gain vengeance against the Tutsis. And so we see the first cycle of violence and instability in newly independent Rwanda start almost immediately in 1963. Some 20,000 Tutsis were murdered and over 300,000 Tutsis were forced into exile in neighboring countries. Uh, many of them ended up fleeing to Uganda, but some fled to Tanzania, some made their way to the Congo, Burundi, 
um, even as far as Kenya, <clears throat> and they lived abroad. Um, this period of violence, um, not that there's a neat start and end to it, but we approximate it began around 1963, right after independence and ended in 1967. And these violent measures were justified by the government as necessary. They saw that they were, def they were defensive measures against repeated incursions of Tutsi refugees living along the Northern border and in a bid to consolidate their power and ensure that the Tutsis were not able to overthrow them. Now, the Belgian initiated identity cards, which we talked about a little bit before, they ended up being used by the new government and uh, were a tool that were used from 1962 onward in order to discriminate against the remaining Tutsi population. They would use those identity cards in order to identify Tutsis in the population and then deny them access to employment, education, opportunities, um, and positions of power and influence. Now, Juvenal Habyarimana, he was a general in the armed forces in Rwanda. He took power in a bloodless coup in 1973, so 11 years later. And he ruled the country um, until his assassination on April 6th, 1994. So he's in power for decades. And it was during this period that we see a group of intimates, mostly from the North, who are like Habyarimana and his wife, Agath, Madame Agath, and they formed something called the Akazu, or Little House. This was a network of individuals that enjoyed positions of power in business and in government. And Madame Agath operated in many ways as the gatekeeper for this consortium. In order to be admitted, most members relied upon some sort of familial connection to or a relationship with Madame Agath rather than her husband, who was in fact the president at the time, she was the one who really wielded the power and over this uh, small network. Uh, the legend of Kanjagera resonated among Rwandans and many of them would actually uh, go on to nickname Madame Agath Kanjagera in light of the power that she wielded during this period from 1973 until 1994. Um, and actually, um, she's still in exile in France, and she's still considered, uh, she still wields considerable influence among some extremists living in exile um, who are against the current Rwandan government. Now, during Habyarimana's 21 years in power, Rwanda's Tutsi minority did suffer discrimination and marginalization, and there were occasional bouts of violence, but nothing nearly as severe as what had taken place in 63 to 67. But by 1994, these Hutu and Tutsi divisions had been internalized within the Rwandan psyche. They didn't even realize that they were a colonial import. And on the evening of April 6, 1994, a private jet carrying President Habyarimana began its descent into Kigali International Airport. And as the plane approached the uh, airport, it was shot out of the sky by a ground to air missile. Two, actually the first one missed, the second one um, hit it. And it, the plane crashed into the presidential co compound, ironically, and killed all of the passengers on board. Immediately, these extremists sprang into action under the direction of several key elites, many of whom were members of the Akazu, that little house that was controlled, that inner circle that was controlled by Madame Agath. They set up roadblocks, they distributed lists of influential Rwandans who were marked for murder, and they conducted home raids. Uh, Rwanda's extremist radio, Radio Television Libre de Milcolin, it was a popular mouthpiece for the Hutu extremists. Uh, they quickly blamed Habyarimana's assassination on the Tutsis and launched a heated campaign to incite genocide around the country. Thus, the assassination of President Habyarimana ends up triggering a series of actions that were prearranged, in my opinion, strong opinion, by members of uh, the Akazu and a secret, secret cabal of conspirators. By the morning of April 7th, the genocide was well underway in the capital city of Kigali, and it soon spread throughout the country. And over the course of the next 100 days, over 900,000 Tutsis and Hutu moderates, we may never know how many people were actually murdered. Um, it, there are some estimates that go well over a million. Um, 
they were systematically hunted, tortured, raped, and murdered as part of an orchestrated genocide. Rwanda and the both the country, I should note, and also the people was completely devastated by this genocide. It's been labeled the fastest genocide in modern history and the loss of life was also compounded by the flight of estimates of about 2 million additional people in just three months. People fleeing the violence and some people fleeing justice, the perpetrators. Up to 150,000 children were orphaned and vulnerable after the genocide. Approximately 250,000 to maybe upwards of a half million women survivors had been raped. Many had been deliberately infected with HIV AIDS and the country's infrastructure was completely devastated. Still, Rwanda went on to rebuild and Rwanda continues to rebuild, not just as a country, but also as a people. And that has also included building its identity, rebuilding its identity, creating a new one. Post-genocide, Rwanda has worked to eliminate some of the codified ethnic-based discriminatory practices uh, and build a new Rwandan identity. This can also be seen in the 2003 constitution that was adopted and other measures taken throughout the country. Um, and I'm starting to see, as a personal anecdote, I'm starting to see some of the impact of these efforts in the next generation of Rwandan youth who are now taking the reins of leadership in Rwanda and they give me great hope that hopefully the legacy of colonialism is further receding into Rwanda's past and will no longer dictate its present and its future. 